There's, I think, two things as you're building community is listen and engage, right? It is not, and I think there's a fallacy here, this term vision that we kick around a lot. Yes, there is that. Like I have a complete kind of image in my mind of what this new project is gonna be, but the path getting there can completely be meandering. That's okay, it doesn't need to be linear. And the only way it gets to some end state, whether it's picture perfect to that vision I had or not, right, is through listening and engaging or observing and engaging. Welcome to Two Sided, the Marketplace Podcast, brought to you by Share Tribe. Hi, I'm Stuart, CMO at Share Tribe, and I'm your host. For this episode, I talked to Charles Adler, who was a co founder of one of the most famous, and I would argue one of the most interesting two sided platforms of the last decade, Kickstarter. I got introduced to Charles through a listener, actually, Kim Laskowski. So thank you very much, Kim. And I would say that this is a, you know, slowly becoming a real podcast. I've used Kickstarter myself and probably some of you as well. So you can imagine I was super excited to talk to Charles. We talk a little bit about the early days of Kickstarter, how they grew organically, while at the same time trying to maintain the quality and more importantly, what Charles calls the vibe of Kickstarter. And Charles also talks about the importance of observing, observing and learning from your users and their behavior, and then going back and designing to improve more of that. And finally, we talk about the possibilities that the current and coming economic hard times might actually give to innovation and possibly the invention of more companies like Kickstarter. I really enjoyed this one and we went a bit long, but I promise you it is worth it. Now, sit back or run or bike or whatever you listen to this podcast and listen to the conversation with Charles Adler. Hi, Charles. Welcome to the show. Hey, what's up? Hey, great. You wanted to join. Of course, I've done some research into who is Charles Adler, but for the people at home listening, could you tell us a little bit about who is Charles Adler? Yeah. Totally happy to. So I guess I would say I am a designer, and I say that somewhat hesitantly because I didn't study design. I didn't go to school for design. I actually went to school for mechanical engineering, and before that was deeply interested in architecture. So I had this like mild plan to go study architecture, which is a longer story. So originally I started out life wanting to be an architect and tried becoming an engineer, and then the internet kind of came along and this is, you know, 93 to 96 period where I was in university and ended up dropping out of engineering school to pursue a job as a, what they used to call a webmaster, which is really just shorthand for, I've been doing this for a long time. And, you know, I'm probably in this conversation because of Kickstarter. So we'll talk a little bit about Kickstarter, but even prior to that was working on what I would say is like community-based projects that supported communities in creative disciplines. So art, design, technology. And so how did that lead to Kickstarter then eventually, like from being a webmaster in the 93 to when did Kickstarter start? Was it 2009? Yeah, 2009. And start is always an interesting thing, right? So we launched April 28th of 2009. I remember the date very deeply for the rest of my life. Maybe it's on my tombstone. Anyway, April 28th of 2009 was when Kickstarter launched. But when it started, actually, is a way, way, way back story. Predates me, predates my other co-founder, Yancey. That was 2001 with our third co-founder, or really the first co-founder, which is Perry. And he was living in New Orleans. So, you know, A, you know, all of these stories have a longer life than when we first noted them or when TechCrunch picked them up. But, yeah. you know, I think the connection for me was just in like how I met Perry and got connected into Kickstarter was, again, kind of connecting back to this previous life. So prior to Kickstarter, I'd run a, my own design studio, design technology studio, building products for clients. And prior to that, I was at a consultancy for about a decade. So working with much larger clients, basically doing product development And it was a colleague of mine, aka a friend of mine that I was working with there that introduced me to Perry, my would-be co-founder. And the two of them were freshman college roommates. 
All right. Right. Yeah. Uh, so you can't really make this up and you can't really plan for any of this. Yeah. Uh, and what I would say is like the connection that I believe Scott, who made the introduction, had was, you know, he just knew me. Like we were friends. We'd go out clubbing together. So he kind of knew some of my, I would say, like out of work idiosyncrasies and also knew that I had been working on a particular project that was about empowering creative community. Yeah. Um, through technology, a.k.a. the Internet. Yeah. Um, and it was, you know, something as simple as that, that got him to connect me to Perry. So what was the idea of Kickstarter then at the time that Scott made that connection that like, oh, like this is something Charles might be interested in? Well, I think, you know, for one, I mean, I will say this, that Kickstarter in 2006, seven, eight, like all of the years we were yeah. building it prior to launching is the same that Kickstarter is now. It's like we were very fortunate in that we didn't do any major pivots. And so the kernel of the product and the kernel of the idea was always there and it stayed consistent. What I would say is the connective tissue, maybe I can describe briefly like what I was building before. Yeah, but maybe you can even tell me what you consider is the kernel of Kickstarter because I'm not even sure if I'm clear on that. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, basically the kernel of Kickstarter was that there were creative people all, all over the place with projects that you never get to hear about because they generally die. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and in the context of Kickstarter, it was about many of them die because they make no financial sense. Right. Or the person creating them doesn't have the network, presumably doesn't have the network to get them funded. Right. And, you know, what I would say is like in the pitch deck, like at the time, uh, in the context of time is very important. If you remember, 2008 was economically a pretty horrific period. Knock, knock, we're in a similar one, actually a worse one. Possibly, yeah. And, you know, part of the argument there is like the rich uncle you used to have is no longer rich. And so <laughs> they can no longer bankroll your project. So go out to your community, right? Yeah. Or, you know, if you're already somewhat established, you can go out to your fans and get funded, right? On that, like kind of reflective of that note, there's a great essay by Kevin Kelly, who was the founding editor of Wired Magazine called the A Thousand True Fans, which basically projects much of the Kickstarter model in some capacity. I mean, it wasn't the inspiration for Kickstarter by any stretch, but it's sort of one of those things we, we found along the way. Anyway, so the, the, the kernel of the idea for Kickstarter was about supporting people on their creative projects, their art projects, their band project, right? Their music project and enabling their friends and family and fans to fund that first version of the thing. And it just kind of grew from there. And I, I would say that the kernel connected back to what, got me introduced to Perry was, you know, what I was building was a much more lo-fi version of that and arguably missing the financial component, right? Uh, okay. So effectively what I was building before was an online zine, if you want to call it that, kind of hearkening back to my kind of punk rock roots. But it was something that I would release every two months with new artists of different genres that didn't have access to a general public. And the fight that I was in, arguably, or the thing that we were trying to get over for folks was, I'm not signed to a record label. I don't have an art gallery that's willing to, you know, do a show for me because I'm not known yet. And so how can these people just get visibility? And to me, as somebody who is always just fascinated with technology and the internet, now arguably like the internet, which was this great connecting conduit. Yeah, how can I create a venue, right, on the internet that drew eyes to underrepresented, invisible, creative people that I think are doing rad stuff? Yeah. And so that was what I was trying to do. And when I met Perry, sort of our very first conversation over the phone, my sort of historical recollection, to what extent this is true or not, I, I can't even <laughs> tell you. But, uh, you know, my emotional kind of memory of that moment was I'm stopping him mid-sentence as he's trying to describe in a long form, not an elevator pitch, what he was trying to build with this thing called Kickstarter. Yeah. Uh, and stopping him mid-sentence being like, I get it. Like, this yeah, is cool. Yeah. Like, let's hang out some more and, and talk in more depth about what it is that you're building. Oh, cool. So in a way, that is kind of the, what you described, indeed, that is also what I would say is indeed Kickstarter has become since then, where you have these on the one side, like if we sort of think about this from a marketplace perspective, where you have like on one side of the platform, you have people who have a particular skill or, or a thing that they have and 
On the other side, you have the entire world on which there are perhaps indeed a thousand fans calling back to that essay that you mentioned that are willing to yeah pre-fund this. Totally. Yeah, that's really clear why that was a good match. So when you joined, was there something like a product already? Was it still being built? And if it was being built, what ended up being sort of the very first version where, let's say, the first thing got funded? So there, yeah, there was no product at the time. And actually, arguably, the gap, like why the introduction was made was my whole background is in a discipline that I think may still exist, but I don't know, called information architecture. Translates very easily to the modern word product, right? Yeah. And Perry didn't have that background. Arguably, Perry's more of an artist than a product person, although he's become a very strong product person, clearly. And he just needed somebody to collaborate with. So actually the first handshake, the first agreement was like, let's just hang out for a couple of weeks. And there was no like, cool, you're going to come in and become co-founder. Like that's a ridiculous, right? Yeah. And so the the relationship was a handshake and saying like, hey, you know, Perry, you know, effectively saying this, if, you know, let's spend a couple of weeks together. And if at the end of those couple of weeks, I feel like I got what I needed, then I'll cut you a check. We'll figure out what that is. And if not, then we'll figure out how to do something longer. And so clearly I never got the check and we did the longer thing. <laughs> and I think much of that was because, A, we were collaborating really well. I innately understood where he was coming from in terms of when I say I use the word creative critically because that I believe that bridges this gap between an artist and either an entrepreneur or an industrial designer or a product developer, right? So, but at the time it was, you know, deeply just focused on art projects. Yeah. And so, yeah, I don't know, we hit it off, we collaborated well, and it was clear that what the concept of what we were working on needed a lot of nurturing because it was so unique as a potential product. Yeah. And so the first version was sort of targeted towards art projects more. Can you tell us maybe a little bit about what was, I don't know, the first project that got funded or got released? I mean, there's always like last time, for example, I previously interviewed someone from Florence. It's a service for getting temporary nurses in the UK. And their first version was like Google Sheets. And like, I've heard similar things. So I'm really curious, like, what was the Kickstarter's first version? Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I was just getting into this discussion with my developer and a collaborator on this new project that I'm working on, which is like, what's the cheapest way to build the thing that we want to build? Like we don't need to actually build software, which is reference to your point about Google Docs. We didn't do any of that. So what I would say is like, we built, I would say something more than an M MVP, but going back to your earlier question about, you know, what was the first funded project or what was the first project that launched? I will say two things, and I think this relates very much to even what I'm doing now. So maybe we can talk about Kickstarter. And I can talk briefly about Lost Arts, just in the mechanisms of getting community and or marketplace going, right? Yeah, please. So, you know, with Kickstarter, know that nobody knew who the hell we were, right? There was no, I mean, there were barely any podcasts, but nobody was going to put Charles Perry or Yancey on a podcast because who the hell are these guys and what's Kickstarter? I don't know what that is. Yeah. And so, you know, just like any entrepreneur, you look around you and say, who do I know that has this problem and how do we solve it? And so the first projects were like our friends, us. I didn't launch one, arguably, but Perry had launched a campaign that did not get funded ridiculously uh, or poetically, <laughs> did not get funded. And it was just him spray painting the bust of Grace Jones. All right. Oh, really? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like on a t-shirt? On a t-shirt, on a blank t-shirt. Yeah. yeah, like whatevs, right? Like, and it didn't get funded. I, I keep telling him you should relaunch that. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. um, so it was projects like that, right? It was yeah. projects like we were all embedded in the arts community of different sorts, right? And A, that was the thing that bonded the three of us as co-founders, but it also got us to focus on almost without distraction, like this particular market. Yeah. And so those are some of the first projects that got launched. The very first project that got funded, I actually don't even know if either of us even know this person. So as, I, as much as I go through and talk about the fact that we invited all of our friends, I don't even know who this person was. So it was all right. by somebody named Dark Pony. So yeah. I, I would argue that pseudonymity is actually kind of awesome. It can get dark, yeah. but it's kind of awesome. Yeah. So Dark Pony, he, she, they don't know. And Dark Pony's project was called Drawing for Dollars. 
which basically explains the entirety of the project. <laughs> Dark Pony wanted to raise, I think, 15 bucks to draw. The assumption was like it, they'll draw three pictures, three, yeah. three backers. I think it's like for five dollars you get a drawing. That was it, right? Like Dark Pony was frustrated with the fact that they would doodle but never complete a drawing, yeah. and felt that the economic pressure would help. To, yeah, it would help. And I thought that was like I don't know. This is so genuinely Kickstarter. It's perfect. It's still perfect. Yeah. And in foreshadowing what Kickstarter would become, although we didn't really recognize this at the time. No. Dark Pony raised $35, right? So okay. it was supposed to raise $15. And that speaks to a couple of things. Somebody was generous or a couple of people were generous. They gave more than what was asked of them. Yeah. And we see that a lot. And the fact that it expressed that you could raise more because that was yeah. always kind of the design of the product was that you couldn't raise less. So it was all or nothing funding, but you could raise as much as you want. And we've seen that. And so did you, for example, handle money already on the platform then? How did that work? Yes, we did. And that's a very difficult story, frankly. So okay, well. difficult stories are good. Uh, drama <laughs> and tension. So yeah, we did. We were using Amazon FPS, which okay. is a flexible payment service. It's one of the sort of sibling products to AWS. It's kind of part of that suite, if you will. Yeah. And I actually believe that is no longer a product of theirs. So I think, which is also to say, I think we were their biggest customer, which is not a good place to be. Yeah. And we're now on Stripe. No, I mean, we don't necessarily need to go into like a, what the service, but more like, I was curious because I could even imagine that they're like, hey, just mail $5 in an envelope to Perry and send him an email and, you know, he'll like. Yeah. So there's a lot in even what you're describing that as you say it, I'm like, no, 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 we would never do that. So, and what I mean by that is one thing I think was really important, and this is maybe pulls from another part of my design background. So one, you could argue like my information architect product background is inspired by or driven by my attraction to architecture. But the other side of my kind of traction to design in general is about communication and brand. And as a brand, we knew, and this is a lot of conversation that Perry and I were having as we were developing the product was we knew we needed to instill trust because we were a new platform with this new weird concept, even though it was, there's a lot of rationale as to how it would be familiar, yeah. but it was still new. And so I think we needed to build trust there as well as not be an intermediary. And that was very important to us from a business standpoint. So the idea that we would hold the money and escrow it kind of, and give it to somebody else, like that wouldn't fit. Yeah. But what was interesting, and I think this is a difficult one, but we had built all these other features, but we had not built the transactional piece of it. And we were looking for, you know, the easy one was we were looking at PayPal, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah because yeah, yeah. there was no FPS that we were aware of, but somehow- nor Stripe, nor anything, anything else usable. Yeah. <laughs> I remember. Yeah. None of that. <laughs> like, I, I, yeah, I think Patrick and his brother were probably in middle school or something. I mean, they're so young when they launched Stripe is kind of amazing, but- Yeah, there was none of that. And so we were looking at PayPal, but with how we were designing what we were building, we actually couldn't use PayPal. We would have gone against their terms of service, which one of our competitors who had launched before us was doing, which is super risky because they could have gotten shut down at any given time. And we just didn't want to take on that risk. And so luckily, I mean, it was literally skin of our teeth, found out about FPS We had launched the same time that they launched. So we got access very early somehow. I honestly don't even remember this. This is probably mostly Perry digging. And we had gotten access very early on. And so for that first, going back to your original question, like, yes, we were running transactions properly through FPS and collecting and delivering money, but we weren't taking any fee. Yeah. As And neither was FPS, actually. Yeah, no, I'm just asking because this is cool because now a lot of actually came out of this question. Mm. It's more like uh, what I've understood from talking to other people who have built things that like handling the payment is a really complex thing. That's not something that a lot of people want to take on so early in the project before you have even sort of validated the idea. So, all yeah. right. Now I'm going to again go like, well, not necessarily technical, but like sort of marketplace theoretical because what I've learned from talking to many of the guests and also reading loads of things about it, that there's always this like constraining taking place and, and probably people listening are like, oh, here comes that question. But like, 
it sounds to me that like you have this natural constraint where you focused on sort of one category first, like without maybe even knowing it or more like, oh, we're really now just serving the arts, like the artsy projects first. Can you tell us like how to sort of progress? Because like I think I became familiar with Kickstarter maybe around the time of first Pebble. Of maybe course, maybe a little yeah. bit earlier. <laughs> I'm I'm not I'm not sure. Yeah, probably one of that batch. Like I don't remember. But that seems a very different kind of project already. Like and that I think that's what a lot of people associated with now. I think like sort of later it shifted more towards tech. But can you talk us a little bit about that sort of evolution? Like because you're obviously not like geographically constrained because people can just pay anywhere on the net. But like how did that expand? Because I think that's very interesting. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, it was organic. And we've always let that happen organically. And what I mean by that is maybe I can tell a story with respect to, we can talk about product development as well. Like how did Pebble get here? And there's this whole genealogy of, that goes back to this guy, Creighton Berman, who's a Chicago industrial designer who put a project up called Pinch, which was the first product on the platform. But you really need to understand, like look at the project and understand why at that time Creighton and then understand Creighton put his project on Kickstarter. Because yeah. I would argue that Creighton is a deeply poetic person and is as a designer, an artist and cares about craft. And I think that thread goes all the way to the Pebble team and, you know, many of the teams since. Yeah. And so there's this connective tissue, but I think the other story that I was going to say kind of related to Creighton, same with, Video games. So video games became a thing. And maybe ignorantly on our part, you know, the three of us grew up playing video games. I might have known some folks that went on to build video. Actually, I did. I worked with somebody who was a video game designer, but I never really thought or really understood the indie game development world. Right? There's this whole underbelly, this whole mm -hmm. subgenre. And what was going on, this is, I want to say 2010, so maybe a year after we had launched. There was a couple of blogs and kind of video series that were going around. I think it was Gamma Sutra, which is a big gaming blog. And they were starting to talk about Kickstarter. Why? Because game developers also listen to music or buy art or fund community projects. And so what you start to realize is there is this like connective tissue as humans that we have. And we're more than just like the stupid thing that we do during the day, right? And Kickstarter has the ability to reach everybody effectively in that way. Yeah. And so I think an important part, which may be foreshadowing a little bit, but one of the things that still remains, I think, a strong cornerstone to the platform and our push as a company to the community is, you know, we'll do some work to support your project. And there's an index where people can find your project, but you know, the majority of the effort is on you. You've yeah. got to be proud of what you're working on. And that's really where that comes from is that motivation of you need to have some skin in the game. And so if, you know, you're in a band and you're funding your album, you're going to do what? Post it on Facebook, post it on Twitter, post it on Instagram, email your, yeah. your mailing list. And if one of those people also makes a video game or is an industrial designer, they're going to start thinking like, huh, that's kind of dope. I've yeah. got this other project that maybe I can use that thing for. And that's yeah. literally how it, you know, how it all kind of unfolds. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like perfect storm, like perfect network effect in a way that like, yeah, like your supply is also like your demands are either way, actually, in your case, <laughs> like they overlap a lot. Yeah. Yeah, it was innate into the design of the platform, frankly. Yeah. So you figured it out before you're like, oh, this is what's going to like you expected that to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was the, yeah, we had hoped that would happen. That was kind yeah. of the design, the architecture, if you will, of how projects would become visible, right? We would do an index, meaning you can go to kickstarter.com slash projects and find stuff, right? Yeah. But we knew because we started, you know, A, we were looking at how did people discover YouTube videos? It wasn't by going to YouTube Dot com at the time that behavior really wasn't there it was and twitter wasn't even really a thing twitter definitely wasn't a thing at that point in time and so there was no twitter there was no instagram there were no, none of these things and so how were people sharing youtube videos email text message i aim if anybody MySpace. remembers aim myspace <laughs> yeah. maybe yeah, yeah totally uh and so like there was fragments of this stuff happening and then as twitter 
launched and we're watching Twitter, the same behavior kind of gets coalesced, right? And what I would say is not only Twitter, but things like Pounce, which no longer exists, but there was this kind of movement of products coming out or with a similar thesis. Yeah. And so it seemed viable. Yeah. And so that's, of course, fantastic. You see that wave come in, you see it expanding, expanding. How did you, I mean, you say that it all grew organically. I assume you did some kind of management, right? Like how, because an important part, of course, you already referred to it earlier that like, hey, trust is really important. And that means that especially on the, uh, let's say the side where the projects are coming, those also need to be trustworthy people. Mm, mm -hmm. How did you handle that? Like, at what point did that become like problematic? And at what point, like, well, could you maybe talk us a little bit through the journey of this like management part, because I think that's very interesting. This is a problem that a lot of marketplaces will have, you know, like same thing with Airbnb or any type like that. How did you maintain that supply? Yeah, so we talked a little bit about the demand piece, right? Like the supply side basically is 90% responsible or 99% responsible for their own demand, generating their own demand. Yeah. And on the supply side, what's interesting, you used a word earlier that I'll come back to, which was constraint. And I'll even reference your Florence and Google Docs reference, All right. right? Which is kind of rad. So it was super hard to get on Kickstarter in 2009, 2010, 2011, right? We had done some things that didn't work. Maybe I'll talk a little bit about that. So another trick I would say that was being replicated because Google had done a great job with it with Gmail was the invite a friend mechanism, right? So Google had, or with Gmail basically grew because you could turn other people on to this new email client by inviting them in, right? So there's like some social capital with that. And so we were like, oh, it's going to be great. A creator is going to know another creator, like artists know other artists and musicians yeah. know other musicians. And so they're going to be like, you got to use this thing. Some of that happened. It didn't really take flight. So what I would say is like, you know, that's just something we learned. It didn't really, it fell flat. So that was a way to, uh, what I would say is like to ease into growing the community on the supply side or the, mm -hmm. the project side. But the other side, meaning the constraint piece is we just didn't want any random person launching a campaign because to your point, it could deplete trust dramatically. Just one project could completely kill the whole platform. Yeah. And we want, we were like very conscious and considerate around just the, what I would say is like the vibe that we wanted to build, right? The community that we wanted to build. Yeah. And so you either needed to be invited by somebody else, invited by us, or if you're just some random person on the street, you needed to know where the alley was. And I'll explain this a little bit more, but you needed to know where the alley was and which door, unmarked door, was the door to Club Kickstarter. So there's a little bit of like punk rock kind of underground techno reference in here, but <laughs> uh, the point being to literally get on the platform, not knowing anybody who's run a campaign or not knowing one of the founders or one of the employees, you needed to go to the FAQ page. That seems pretty illogical, right? You need to go to the FAQ page. And instead of reading the FAQ, you needed to read this crappy little paragraph in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. And embedded in that paragraph was a something to the effect of, if you're interested in running a, launching a campaign, contact us hyperlink to an email. And so it was like really hard. There was no big green start button, right? It was not just, you know, easy. And then we actually had to respond to your email. And the idea was that you would pitch us what you wanted to fund. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes we ignored those emails. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, ultimately that wasn't about being arrogant. It wasn't about, you know, being underground or mean. It was, um, it was really about quality. Yeah. And we just had a sense of quality which I guess was subjective with this goal of over time, we would understand what quality meant objectively and which would allow us to not make it so difficult to get on the platform and allow us to do what you can do now, which is just go and sign up and launch your campaign. And the bump to get launched is actually really, really low. Yeah. So, you know, at what point was that email address like no longer <laughs> feasible? Like, like, 
when you ran, oh, when you ran out of interns to enter those. Like, why did you do that? Because I think this makes a lot of sense. What you're saying, you know, you keep a high threshold, you keep quality in. That button with the email, I've also heard that story before. I'm going to reference an earlier episode where I interviewed Ruthie Amaru from Fredos, which is like a freight booking platform. Hmm. Yeah, where it yeah, has yeah. like a really complicated calculation on the front. And when, when you said book it, she just literally got an email and then she would actually make all the matches behind the scenes. So that makes a lot of sense to me. It, it's expensive to build these things. So like you, if you can find shortcuts that have human means and all the better. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. One thing you mentioned that like, yeah, some projects could deplete the trust. Did you see something like that happen early on where you realized, oh, this is going to go off? Was there any interesting stories there that you thought like, oh, we shouldn't have done this or we saw some signs early on, but we ignored them or I don't know, or that surprisingly came back to life that just sort of taught you about how this could impact trust? Well, okay, so I can, I'll talk about three things in there. One is I'll start on the positive and then maybe end on the depleting of trust. So I think what you're reflecting on is like, are there projects that taught us something? Because I think there's learnings in every one of these steps and much like your reference to Airbnb, like they've had learnings that they then impart into either the product or the guidelines for using the platform, right? And so what's interesting, I think about product development with software, particularly software that is on the internet, right? So cloud-based services is that they're constantly morphing, like constantly. And yet still, I mean, it's kind of not necessarily imparted in your question, but we still have this frame of reference that like you built a thing and that's the thing, right? Like you shipped it, right? Like this MacBook that I'm looking at, like it's kind of done. You can't really do much with it once it's shipped. And so what's fun about that is that every day, I mean, even 10 years plus on, we can learn and change the product or change the guidelines and change something about the community that is in response to behavior, positive or negative that we see. So I'll go back to it. What was really exciting in the first year, first two years was like, you get these little moments. Usually there's a question of like, when did you know? And I was like, well, there's a whole bunch of moments when I knew, and it was about scale. Right. Yeah. So Allison Weiss is a singer songwriter. And that was a moment that we knew that we had done something really well. So it was in like the summer of 2009. We've been launched for a couple months, if not weeks. And then there was Scott Thomas, who a couple months later, who raised the most money at the time, which was like eighty seven thousand dollars. Right. Like, oh, my gosh. Right. Yeah. Uh, then there was Scott Wilson, who which kind of expresses this bridge between categories. So Scott Thomas had a publishing, he wrote a book and Scott Thomas also lived in Chicago. Scott Wilson lived in Chicago. He was an industrial designer. It just so happens that Scott Wilson had contracted Scott Thomas at one point in his life as a graphic designer, which is how Scott Wilson found out about Kickstarter. And Scott Wilson, a couple of years later or a year later, launches a campaign to fund something called TikTok. Oh my God, that's a different meaning these days. Anyway, TikTok at the time (laughs) was a wristband that held the iPod Nano to create a proxy to the Apple Watch that Apple had not come out with yet, right? Scott Wilson went on to raise just shy of a million dollars. For the wrist watch thing. For the wrist watch, TikTok thing. And so there's yeah. this really interesting, somebody needs to do it, this genealogy of projects and categories. But yeah. you know, the point being is like, there's all these moments of learning and these moments of reflection and these moments where you realize it's working and could work better. And then I would say that there's the other end of your spectrum that is, you know, where do things not go so well and how do you learn from those? And there's always going to be those, Right. And, you know, I guess, I mean, some of these are very public and my memory is a little foggy with some of these. I've been out of the company for a couple of years now. But, you know, I guess what I would say is that most of the issues that we've run into, I think, speak to community. And in some cases, it's about information, like what do you share about your project at the time of launch? And then what do you add to it later that allows us to better understand what you're building, right? Yeah. And so what I mean by that is, you know, you go to launch your campaign, you say one thing, it looks pretty innocent. And then over time, you realize like, oh, this could be a pretty bad thing. And what's been interesting, I would say, and this, I think this is the, frankly, another facet 
about the internet that is beautiful is the internet is just a way for people to connect. And sometimes that is connecting with companies and calling them out when something looks distrustful or unsavory or wrong. Yeah. And so there've been a number of cases where we've been turned on to things that at the launch looked really innocent and passed our test, whatever that was at the time. Yeah. Uh, that the internet goes like, hey, you're wrong. Like this seems pretty dangerous in some way. Uh, and there've been a couple of cases where that's happened where we shut projects down or have had to change guidelines by virtue of that learning. So, And that's a good thing, of course, about having a community on that one side, which is sort of like a self-regulating power at some point where like those things organically get serviced. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't looking for dirt. Like, don't get me wrong. It's more like, <laughs> like, I know for a fact that you didn't come out with the, like, you'd never come out with the perfect version out of the gate. So there's all these like small incremental things that you, that you learn to make it better. And now, well, we've also sort of, I mean, that sort of also answers my earlier question, like, how do you maintain quality? But maybe we could expand a little bit on that still, like, so post the hidden email address and this sort of big community, like, how did you do that in between? Like, did you have some kind of community manager? Just how did you maintain quality while you were scaling? So generally, most projects created discussion. So when it was just the email address that you had to get to from the FAQ page, you know, there was a small group of people that were kind of conversing about each project. And it was so early on that those, the response back to those folks was generally also filled with guidance, right? And so, you know, A, there was discussion within uh, a team called the community, community team at Kickstarter. Some projects scaled up to conversations with Perry and me and the whole company, which at that time was maybe like 12 people, like super small, right? And some of those projects created a fierce amount of debate. Should we, shouldn't we? Should we, shouldn't we? Should we, shouldn't we? Right? Yeah. And so I'll give an example that I think, frankly, at this point is pretty innocent. But there was a somebody who wanted to fund their wedding. And what they had proposed for their wedding was actually kind of dope. Like it was super creative and super fun. And you could argue like culturally totally belongs on Kickstarter. The concern was that what it's going to generate is a whole bunch of people using Kickstarter for their wedding, which is not interesting to us, right? Was not what we wanted. And so a lot of it was, what I would say is, what do some of these projects create as optics? Because at the end of the day, like people are going to water things down, right? So meaning a couple wants to do their wedding, they happen to, you know, get an email or see some article about, look at this creative couple, doing their kooky wedding in this way, right? And all they see is money wedding. And they don't, they completely scope over the fact that they've actually put creative energy and artistic energy into whatever their wedding was supposed to be. Yeah, it's like the thing minus uh, what you said, the vibe, right? A hundred percent, yep. Yeah. And so we were really trying to protect against that. You know, I'd say that, that those were some of those discussions. Once we were at a point where we could effectively afford a team to then build tools internally, like yeah. curation effectively, and actually a tool that you could actually just go and launch your campaign. That then, you know, at that point, still a system in place is just more mechanical, so to speak. Yeah. But it's, you know, and now, you know, I, I think going back to that subjective to objective, there's certain categories that generally speaking, we don't really have too much pre-oversight on. No. Um, whereas there's some categories that we still keep an eye on because just the players involved could change the temperature of the water at Kickstarter. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's really cool to hear because indeed, like, it will be difficult to translate something like that into a process where like, oh, yeah, this flies in, this flies out. It feels that there's a lot of like, I like this idea of like temperature of the water in a fire. That makes a lot of sense. If I can make this one comment, I was speaking at a conference a couple of years ago and the gentleman before me was from GitHub if anyone's familiar with GitHub. And he closed with a statement that just struck me so hard. And it was such an innocent statement. And I should maybe state the audience. The audience was a global group of executives, which is to say they didn't write code and they didn't use Figma or Photoshop. Like they didn't design. And they used spreadsheets perhaps. And it's not a criticism, just a statement. Yeah. And his closing remark was that the internet is handmade. The internet is handmade, which is there are actual humans who write code 
and is not an automated process. None of it is. They build things that create automated processes, but there are always people behind them, which then gets into the whole narrative around bias. We can talk about that in another podcast, I guess. But (laughs) um, what struck me about that, and I think goes back to your comment, is there are people behind the scenes, Airbnb, Uber, Kickstarter, Etsy, like all of these places, Twitter, right? That genuinely care and are constantly reflecting on the behaviors on their platforms and either debating change or making change. And so all of these products that we frankly take for granted many times, which I am victim of too, there are people back there that and many, 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 many people that are responsible for those products. And yeah. Yeah, that's a nice thought. Like, I really like that idea, especially indeed, like a lot of the companies you mentioned actually have some kind of very strongly creative person at the beginning, like for sure. Airbnbs, especially, for example. So coming back to the supply and the demand thing, did you ever create anything that made that incentive just a little bit better for people to start projects who had previously only been a backer? Because I mean, mm. it grows organically. Maybe you never had to actually fire it up. But did you do something around that? Because that would make sense to me. So yeah, no, I think that's a great question, which is, you know, getting that flywheel to go a little bit faster on the supply side. Yeah. So in a way that it actually kind of goes back to the Gmail comment. Like, so why didn't the invite a friend thing not work? Well, I may know somebody that is working on an album, but how often are you working on an album? Like you release an album every couple of years. If you're really prolific, maybe once a year. If you're cray cray, then maybe a couple times a year. Or if you're really modern and you like were born with SoundCloud, you don't even understand what a concept of an album is, I guess. But anyway, you know, these projects don't happen all the time. And so, you know, I would argue that's why that feature probably did not work. How that then relates to your question around getting that flywheel going. We had come up with an initiative. I think we called it small projects. And I think there's a new term for it now because small projects just sounds infantile. It doesn't sound really great, but Basically, you know, a lot, what we realized, and it's understandable, is that a lot of people saw launching a Kickstarter campaign as hyper stressful, their magnum opus. This is the one time I have to go ask the general public, right? Which is not true or fair to yourself, right? And so what we wanted to do is basically lower the bar, like, yo, just come up with something goofy, like go back to Perry's, you know, spray painting Grace Jones on a t-shirt, like that's totally cool, Yeah. right? And so if we can lower the bar, we have the potential, and this was really the motivation, was we have the potential to increase creativity, like increase your creativity. Not everything needs to be some massive thing that you're going to fund for hundreds of thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars. And so that's actually been super valuable and super fun to watch, like people coming up with kind of almost nonsensical projects. So if you look at the lineage of their campaigns. Yeah. So, you know, effectively, it's just a way to, it's almost like, you know, if you think about painting or drawing, if you ever take a painting class, which I have not done since middle school, frankly, but if you go to take a painting class, you generally have to do something very, very, just draw, right? And usually the first, you know, the sort of foundational classes is like, you just draw, like, just, you got to get into the rhythm of, it's like wrist work. You just need to get in the rhythm of, and flexibility is almost like a dexterity thing. Same with photography, like just go out and shoot. Like you're never going to take a great photograph your first time. And so in a way, what I would argue is it was just about like decreasing the big perceptive barrier and giving people permission to create something super small, like a weekend project, something that you would literally fund in five days, like super small and it had to be like less than a thousand bucks. And so that's been actually really, really fruitful. Yeah, uh, that's cool to hear because I remember that at one point there was this whole ancillary industry about like, hey, we can help yep. you make your Kickstarter and that like, oh, you already need like whatever, 50,000 to shoot the video for your Kickstarter campaign. And so it felt like it was becoming extremely professional. Like, yeah, wow, like where do I get the funding to 100%. start my campaign? Like, And same thing, for example, now, are you familiar with Product Hunt? Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, yep. so like... There's the same thing, right? Like that used to be just, hey, just drop the link of your project there and then hope we get some votes. And now there's like all these guides, like how to launch on Product Hunt. So it's really cool. Like I like that idea that because I never, until you now told me this, I never realized that that actually has some potential detrimental effect on the supply side coming in. And if you somehow are able to lower that again and indeed sort of like get the next generation of projects in. 
Totally. I mean, I think what we're talking about is perception, yeah. right? And you're playing with perception for the benefit of the audience, frankly. I actually didn't know that about Product Hunt, but what you're describing about Product Hunt is an exact replica of what was happening and has happened on Kickstarter. You could look at eBay. There are, I mean, I remember when there were brick and mortar businesses, it's a Corona yeah. joke, I guess, but when we were still developing Kickstarter, I was living in Brooklyn at the time. I remember on Flatbush Avenue, there was a store that baffled me. And it was a store where you go in and bring in your stuff and they will post it on eBay and sell it for you. And I was like, yeah. WTF, what is that? That's crazy. But, you know, that also speaks to the eBay being a super healthy business because another business can basically benefit off of them. Yeah. And so, you know, I think the last thing I guess I'll say to that is just that I think anything that we can do to simplify, lower that perceptive barrier, because it is just a perception. I mean, there is, you know, people will talk up, you need this whole like promotional campaign. You need, you know, spend $10,000 or whatever the number is on a video. Go back and look at the video from Pebble One. <laughs> it was horrible in the most beautiful way. Yeah. Right. And I say that affectionately, not critically, because the bar it doesn't have to be that high. No. It doesn't take a lot of production value. It just takes a lot of heart and a lot of honesty. Yeah. So I have two more questions. First one would be, you said you came from a background of trying to connect creative people with the internet and bring these things together. And now you've done that through Kickstarter. How do you see that? And I think like now, if you look around, like there's a lot of these things, like this community thing is really going strong now. There's this thing like Substack. I don't know if you're familiar with that, with all these newsletters, which is kind of like the same thing where like they just provide a way for writers, let's say, to connect to their audience. Do you have any thoughts about where this is going? Do you see, and are you even working on something like this? Yes. What I would say is I'm working on something new, right? That is yeah, okay. oriented around um, community and creative community. And arguably it's focused on creative process. So like, how do you build tools that support creative process, right? That movement from idea to object. And, you know, I think what's, maybe there's a piece as somebody who's kind of coming around 360 degrees, like crazily starting another company again, or what I would more truthfully say is building another product to hopefully build another company again, is time is such an interesting part of the equation. And what I mean by that is it's been a decade since I've been in this position again. It was a decade ago, longer than that, that we were building Kickstarter. And as I said earlier, like there was no Twitter. Twitter was just text-based at the time, actually, when it launched and we were in development. Ruby on Rails was barely a thing, right? And I don't even, I think Foursquare might have been around. And so what I would say is all of those things from the past inform the future, right? So you could not have TikTok without Instagram. You could not have Instagram without Flickr, if anybody remembers Flickr, right? You could not have Slack without Flickr because Stuart founded both of those things. Yeah, that's right? true. Yeah, yeah. And ironically, I am fascinated by this with Stuart Butterfield. You could have neither of those things if Stuart wasn't obsessed with video games because arguably he was trying to build video games and instead built these two other products. He's like an edge case of edge cases. But yeah. But another great example of what you said earlier that like, hey, somewhere underneath this machine, there's people making things. Yeah, for sure. And, yeah. and so I, I guess, you know, what I would say is like time is interesting because I now get to, if I was building this new thing that I'm working on called Lost Arts, is if I was building mm -hmm. this in the same way that I was building Kickstarter, it's not so much that it wouldn't work. It's just not relevant anymore. Right. And that is not taking the best advantage of all the new tools and all the new, all the new research and or insight that has come since then. So there's that. And then I guess the question is like, where is this all going? That is a loaded question because we're, yeah. I will say that because we're in another one of these very deeply pivotal moments, which is not only economic, but behavioral. What I mean by that is economic, meaning millions of people are losing their jobs, like fact, right? Similar to 08. But on top of that, millions of people are dying and new behaviors are being built. Like I have a mask over here, Right. I wash my hands 17 times a day. We're all becoming Howie Mandel. There's a joke in there, right? Which is yeah. OCD and like, don't touch me. And so I think 
somewhere in there will inform arguably this wave of innovation and arguably maybe more so the next wave of innovation, right? Which I just find fascinating. Right? Yeah. No, I think there's like, if you also look at like a whole stray of the companies you've mentioned were founded exactly in that same period, like yeah. 08 or just after. So, so what's the mother of innovation? Like what's the, there's a saying there, like something yes, is I the mother of innovation. What, God. Yeah, 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 yeah. But something about things being limited. <laughs> I guess what I would say and where that reflection comes from in terms of time is that, you know, in my heart, I'm a designer. And I think the heart of design is observation, right? And so Kickstarter comes from observation. Perry's observation, my observation, Yancey's observation, observation through experience. And what I'm working on now is built on the observation and experience that I've had pre-Kickstarter, during Kickstarter, and post-Kickstarter. And all of the things in our market of software technology that has come since that. All right, cool. Then very last question. Any advice you would have for an aspiring marketplace entrepreneur based on your experience that you would have done differently when you're like, oh man, if you're considering doing this, I would think twice. I would never give that advice per se, although I've probably given that advice before. I think if we go back to that last statement I made, which is about observation, because I'm in this moment right now, literally, right? So I have a few people, 25 people or so testing out this early, early alpha that I've built. And if you were to look at it face value, there's not a lot of activity, so it's not very successful. But I knew with what we've built, it wouldn't be successful. I've got to keep reminding myself of that. So going back to the observation thing, there's, I think, two things as you're building community is listen and engage, right? It is not, and I think there's a fallacy here, this term vision that we kick around a lot. Yes, there is that. Like I have a complete kind of image in my mind of what this new project is going to be, but the path getting there can completely be meandering. That's okay. It doesn't need to be linear. And the only way it gets to some end state, whether it's picture perfect to that vision I had or not, right, is through listening and engaging or observing and engaging. So I'm watching what people are doing or not doing and then engaging them to better understand what is it that you're trying to do and how do I make that better? And so I think that is critically important. And I think that goes back to all the stories I've told about Kickstarter as well, which is, you know, we're responding constantly to the ecosystem of projects and the people behind them. All right. Let's end on that. That's great advice. Thanks very much, Charles. Any last plugs, by the way? Is there anything you want people to do, check out, look up? Yeah, I guess, you know, if you're interested in this new thing that I'm working on called Lost Arts, which is effectively a tool about creative process, supporting you through creative process and community, you can go check out lostarts.co or L-O-S-T-A-R-T-S dot C-O where there's nothing to do but sign up for an email list to get notified when we're going to launch. All right, great. Thanks very much for being on the show. I really appreciate the time and insights. See you. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been super fun. Thank you for listening to Two Sided, the Marketplace podcast. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe. If you listen on iTunes, we'd also love for you to rate and give us a review. If you got inspired to build your own marketplace, go visit www.sharetribe.com. It's the fastest way to build a successful online marketplace business. Until next time.